Hello, my name is Adriana Zavala, and I'm an Associate Professor of Art History and Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University. It's my pleasure and privilege to present this virtual lecture in support of the exhibition, Frida Kahlo Timeless. I want to acknowledge and thank the staff at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art and the McAninch Art Center of the College of DuPage, especially Justin Witte and Molly Janokas, for inviting me to contribute this recorded presentation. In my lecture, titled Frida Kahlo's Creativity, Staging Art, Staging Life, I will offer a close examination of several of Kahlo's most important paintings. And I will also share insights on Frida Kahlo's creative self-adornment and the extraordinary arrangement of her home and garden. Along with her visual art, these were important modes of creative expression for Frida Kahlo. Along the way, I'll also touch upon other artists, ranging from Diego Rivera to Nicholas Marai, who collaborated with Kahlo to facilitate the promotion of her art, her cultural politics, and her image. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm the descendant of European settlers in central Mexico, who occupied the ancestral territory of Anahuac, the home of Nahuatl-speaking Mexica, Chalca, Tepaneca, Tlaxcaltecan, Xochimilco, Tepanec, Huejotzinca peoples, among other groups, including the Otomi. I live in Medford, Massachusetts, and I teach at Tufts, both of which are on the unceded ancestral homelands of the Wampanoag, Pawtucket, and Massachusetts peoples. I offer this land acknowledgement in a gesture of respect and gratitude, and in support of greater visibility for indigenous and native people in Mexico, the United States, Canada, across Latin America, and around the world, and to stand in solidarity with them in their struggle for recognition, sovereignty and autonomy. As a scholar of Mexican art, I have endeavored to serve as an ambassador for Mexico and for Mexican culture, while at the same time bringing recognition to the ways in which intellectuals in 20th century Mexico both valued but also appropriated indigenous culture, forms, and heritage in their own formulation of Mexican revolutionary nationalism. So let us begin. Among the cultural legacies of revolutionary nationalism are two important concepts, mestizaje, which means mixture or synthesis, and indigenism, or indigenismo. Both were foundational to the formulation by mostly white identified intellectual elites <clears throat> of a modern cultural consciousness we call Mexicanidad. This is an incorporationist symbolic ideology that in the 1920s and 30s, in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution of 1910, was mobilized in the service of a discursive reconciliation of Mexico's mixed identity. As such, it's important to recognize in any discussion of Frida Kahlo's creativity that she was an indigenista who showed great admiration for the culture and especially the clothing of indigenous peoples in Mexico. However, she was the descendant of a German father and a mestiza mother. While it appears that Kahlo's mother, Matilde Calderon, may have had ancestral roots in the Zapotec region of Southern Mexico, Kahlo would not have been considered indigenous during her lifetime. Moreover, her father, Guillermo or Wilhelm Kahlo, was a German immigrant who arrived in Mexico City in the 1890s. Based on this family lineage, Kahlo would not even have entirely qualified in the nationalist context of Mexico as a mestiza. Because mestizos in the nationalist imaginary are the descendants by culture or lineage of Spaniards and indigenous people. This is important insofar as we must recognize that while she and her husband, the muralist Diego Rivera, were passionate about Mexico's indigenous cultures and heritage, in some regards, they also appropriated them as did most nationalist intellectuals of their day, to promote a post-revolutionary cultural renaissance. While they were doing so, most, if not all, indigenous people in Mexico were subject to state programs of re-education and proletarianization in the interest of addressing what was termed at the time the Indian problem. To elaborate on these points a bit, let us begin by looking at a painting in which Kahlo reflected upon her heritage. 
my grandparents, my parents, and I. A painting in oil and tempera on zinc from 1936. Here, Kahlo shows herself standing in the center of the courtyard garden of her family home, which is now known as the Casa Azul, and is of course the Museo Frida Kahlo in Coyoacán, a suburb, a suburb in Southern Mexico City. In 1939, Kahlo gave an interview in which she described the painting as follows. Quote, the whole house is in perspective as I remember it. On the top of the house in the clouds are my father and mother when they were married. The portraits are taken from photographs. The ribbon around me and my mother's waist becomes an umbilical cord and I become a fetus. On the right, the paternal grandparents, on the left, the maternal grandparents. A ribbon encircles all the group, symbolic of the family relation. The German grandparents are symbolized by the sea and the Mexican by the earth." Close quote. Notice that here, Kahlo sets herself as a little girl nude in the center of the family unit. She holds the ribbon that binds the two branches of her family tree together, and she stands literally in the center of the family garden. I'll return to consider the garden and home shortly. I want to note here that the scholar Ganit Ankori has offered a very interesting interpretation of this painting as a family tree, relating it to the practice of genealogies, particularly those that were impelled by the anti-Semitic Nuremberg laws enacted in Germany under the Nazis. In that context, many German families, including those in, in the German community in Mexico, created genealogies to prove their so-called Aryan heritage. By 1936, when she created this painting, Kahlo was ardently anti-Nazi and anti-fascist, and she even claimed Jewish ancestry, no doubt to challenge the anti-Semitism of the day. Let's observe some additional details. Notice the portrait of Kahlo's parents. This was copied from a photographic wedding portrait of, of her parents who married in 1898, and you see that portrait here. While Kahlo shows herself in utero against her mother's belly, notice the cactus flower being pollinated beneath an image of the fertilization stage of human embryogenesis. That this occurs on the Mexican side of the family tree suggests that this was for Kahlo the site of greater ancestral vitality. While Kahlo's maternal grandparents do appear to be indigenous descended mestizos, notice her mother's fashionable Victorian style wedding dress. Photographs of Matilde Calderon suggest that like her daughter Frida, she too had a penchant for elaborate clothing and even fanciful costumes. A re recently uncovered photographic archive has revealed that Matilda may have had some Zapotec heritage. Here she's shown among family members, and she, along with several of the women in the family, are dressed in the iconic garments worn by Zapotec women from Mexico's Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And you see Matilda here. This is a costume that Kahlo, among other nationalist intellectuals, made famous. Here, we're looking at a map of Mexico, and I've called out the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the Southern state of Oaxaca down here. The Isthmus is a culturally rich Zapotec region and already in the 19th century became an economically strategic zone when efforts were made to build a railway and even a canal there to connect the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. As a result, Zapotec women in this region gained notoriety among metropolitan intellectuals and foreign travelers because of their regal beauty, their distinctive clothing, and especially the elaborate lace headdress they wear on festive occasions. The headdress may in fact be a repurposed European petticoat. Because the Juanas play an important economic role within their communities, they have been mythologized as sexually liberated, powerful matriarchs. However, this is a much exaggerated claim. The photograph that I'm showing to the left shows Frida Kahlo here, with Diego Rivera seated here, the New York-based photographer Nicholas Murai, the artist Miguel Covarrubias, his wife Rosa Rolanda, and two sisters whose names were Alfa and Beda Rios Pineda. Alfa and Beda were prominent women intellectuals, and they were Zapotec from, this, from Huchitan de Zaragoza, one of two key towns in the Isthmus powerfully identified with the Huantepec culture. 
Notice that all four women wear the distinctive and beautiful costume from the Isthmus. In fact, Rosa Rolanda, who you see here dressed in Tijuana costume in two portraits taken by the US photographer Edward Weston, was a modern dancer from the United States who married the Mexican artist Miguel Covarrubias. In the 1940s, Miguel and Rosa spent time in Tehuantepec, studied the people and culture there, and published an anthropological study in 1947 called Mexico South, Isthmus of Tehuantepec. I share this because it's important to understand Kahlo within her historical context. Here on the right, you see a photograph of Frida with her sister Cristina's children, Isolda and Antonio. And you might notice that Isolda, who looks to be about four years old, is dressed in the distinctive Tijuana costume as well, while Antonio, who looks to be about two or three, is dressed as an iconic charro, a Mexican cowboy. I've also included a photograph of Kahlo herself, taken by the American photographer Bernard Silverstein in 1940. Here she appears wearing the full Tijuana regalia. In an interview in the 1940s, Kahlo claimed to have no ancestral ties to the Huantepec. She nevertheless claimed this costume as her own. In the center of the screen, I'm showing you another photograph that depicts the painter Maria Izquierdo on the left here and the photographer Lola Alvarez Bravo. Notice that they too are wearing the costume from Tehuantepec, and neither of these women was Zapotec or from the Isthmus. In this portrait, <clears throat> in these two portraits, one a self-portrait and the other by Nicholas Marai, Kahlo has honed in on her face in self-portrait as Tehuana or Diego on my mind. In the center of the Tijuana ornate lace headdress called the Bidaniro in Zapotec or the large huipil, we see her impassive expression. The word huipil refers to a blouse as well as the head coverings worn by women from many different indigenous groups in Mexico. In fact, Tijuanas wear two huipils. Their velvet blouses with elaborate embroidery are technically speaking huipils. The stitching is very specific to different communities, and in some cases may also show the influence of Asian textiles that came into Mexico in the 17th and 18th century through the galleon trade from the Philippines. Meanwhile, the large lace huipil, the bidaniro, is worn by Tehuanas on festive occasions. They're made from starched and pleated lace and satin ribbon. As a result of their form in Spanish, they're also called resplandor, which means radiant. In the self-portrait, Kahlo almost seems to acknowledge the artifice of her own self-fashioning with the headdress, a practice that the scholar James Oles has called cultural cross-dressing. Here, the delicate vines and tendrils that emanate from the crown of flowers also seem to suspend the, the lace headdress within the frame of the painting. It's as if Kahlo has simply placed her face into the opening of a painted carnival cutout or photo stand-in as for example, this carnival cutout over here. Let's look at the photograph by Nicholas Marai. Here, Frida Kahlo appears visually photogenic, dark, piercing, at times in passive eyes, framed by a striking unibrow, full lips curled up slightly at the corners and usually painted red, the soft fuzz of her almost mustache, elaborate hair worn up and adorned with flowers and ribbons and dramatic jewelry. Given her iconic status among the art aware and adoring fans alike, one could say that Kahlo was chemically photogenic for she truly produced or emitted light. Her mastery of the pose is in full evidence in this photograph. Kahlo and Mariah met in the early 1930s and became lovers. Over the years of their intimate relationship, and then later as platonic friends, he took dozens of photographs of her, which have themselves contributed to her iconic status. This one, taken in New York in 1939, is informed by Marai's work as a commercial photographer for women's magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, among others. While Kahlo appeared in the pages of Vogue in October 1937, her first appearance on the cover of the magazine was with this photograph, in 2012. Though taken in 1939, it seems tailor-made for the magazine.
Photography played a central role in Frida Kahlo's life and art. She was intimately familiar with the medium as a result of her close bond with her father, Guillermo. After arriving in Mexico in 1891, he became a successful photographer with a prestigious studio in downtown Mexico City. His most significant commissions were photographs of important buildings, including new landmarks built during the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. Guillermo Calo earned a distinctive reputation as the first official photographer of Mexico's cultural patrimony. But he is said to have disliked portrait photography because, quote, he did not wish to improve on what God made ugly. In truth, however, he excelled at portraiture, and yet he appears to have reserved that talent for his family. In one such photo, taken on February 7th of 1926, when Frida Kahlo was just 19, she famously appears dressed in a man's three-piece suit. From left to right, we see her sisters, Adriana and Cristina, and then Frida in the center, then her cousin, Carmen Romero, and Carlos Veraza, Adriana's stepson. The group poses in the covered entry to the interior garden at the center of the Kahlo family home. As the tallest of the group, Frida dominates the image. Her facial expression is strong and confident, especially in comparison to the younger Verasa, who looks meek. Meanwhile, Frida epitomizes stylish androgyny. Her hair is center parted and slicked back. She holds a walking stick, a dignified accessory, but also a useful one, given that when this photograph was taken, she was still recovering from the near fatal traffic accident that nearly took her life in September of 1925 and left her permanently disabled. By dressing in this manner, Kahlo telegraphs her nonconformity, even her queerness in contemporary parlance. While gender nonconforming people were not entirely unheard of in Mexico City in the 1920s, they were certainly not the norm. So to appear this way, even amongst family and friends, already suggests Kahlo's strong personality, her wit, and her highly individualistic sense of self. In the second photograph on the right, Kahlo wears a dark satin knee-length dress with an unusual orientalist ele element on the front, light stockings and Mary Jane shoes. Notice that she holds a book. She is the young intellectual. Until the fateful accident in 1925, Kahlo had been just one of 35 female students at Mexico City's prestigious National Preparatory School. She aspired to be a doctor, but her high school education was cut short by the accident and a long recovery. Notice as well that both photographs appear to have been taken on the same day, as indicated by the date inscribed by Kahlo's father in the lower margin. That Frida chose to pose in two distinctly different outfits on a single day is suggestive of her understanding of how clothing telegraphs one's sense of identity and one's public self-construction. Contrary to the image of Kahlo that we think of today, crystallized in her innumerable self-portraits in which she wears elaborate embroidered huipils, her hair braided, handcrafted jewelry. Here, Kahlo is the quintessential modern girl. The straight tailoring of her dress, her short slicked back hair, style, styled in a version of the fashionably modern bob of silent film stars like Louise Brooks, casts her as a chica moderna or modern girl. In Mexico City, the term pelona or baldy was employed in the 1920s to describe young women like Frida Kahlo, who with their short hair, expressed their nonconformity to conservative societal norms. While Kahlo was not alone, as we have seen in adopting indigenous styling, or even here in embracing the style of the modern woman, it is clear that whatever she did, she did with gusto, as we say in Spanish, that is to say with intensity and pleasure. This is true as well of the way in which she redecorated her parents' home once she and Rivera married. At this juncture, I want to turn to consider the ways that Frida Kahlo's home and garden were also an outlet for her creativity. Recall that in 1936, Kahlo depicted herself as a toddler standing in the family garden. She also rendered the home in meticulous detail, complete with an orange tree in the center of the garden, sunflowers, which you see here, and a tiny yellow chair. The garden served the family as a private recreational space. The home also had a laundry yard for servants that you see to the right-hand side of the composition.
The Kala home was built around 1905. Its original style was neoclassical, as seen in a photograph in the upper left. This was typical for comfortable families like the Kalos. However, during the decade of the Mexican Revolution, from 1910 to 1920, the family fell on hard times as Guillermo Kahlo's commissioned work for the government came to an end. In 1930, having just married Frida, Diego Rivera paid off the mortgage and Kahlo's father deeded the house in Frida's name. Frida and Diego's transformation of Guillermo and Matilda's home is evident if we compare these two photographs. On the upper left, a photograph from around 1910, which while in black and white, um, suggests that the home was probably a pale color, perhaps pale gray. And notice the exterior is painted to call out the neoclassical pilasters, corner details, and dental molding at the roof line. The, the photograph on the right is of the house today, the Museo Frida Kahlo, with its signature brilliant and very Mexican blue walls and accented with russet red frames around the green shuttered windows. The photograph in the center, dated to 1930 by Guillermo Calo, shows the family's former dining room stripped of the Victorian style furnishings that would have been the norm in such a house and decorated instead in a rustic style that is quintessentially folkloric and Mexican. The folkloric character of the home is clear in photographs taken in 1939 by Nicholas Murai particularly the colorized photograph on the right. Here we see Kahlo in the garden that she and Rivera also transformed. In the black and white photograph, notice the addition of pre-Columbian artifacts and rustic sculptures by a self-taught sculptor named Mardonio Magaña. Rivera collected and promoted Magaña's work as expressing a quintessentially authentic aesthetic rooted in the people. Magaña worked in wood and stone, and his sculptures typically represent humble subjects like peasants and animals. The home became Kahlo's primary residence from the late 1930s until her death in 1930, excuse me, 1954. With Rivera, she redecorated the home with rustic furniture, woven straw floor coverings called petates, as well as Mexican folk art, Rivera's growing collection of pre-Columbian antiquities and even modern art. Eventually, it came to be known as the Casa Azul, so named, of course, for the vivid indigo blue walls that Kahlo and Rivera used to make the home stand out among its neighbors. In addition, in the late 1930s, Frida and Diego acquired two parcels of adjacent land and they expanded the garden and the living space of the home. Rivera built a pyramid structure in one section of the garden, which you see here in the photograph on the right. He used the pyramid to display objects from his growing collection of pre-Columbian antiquities. The pyramid is also an expression of his abiding interest in Aztec architecture, urbanism, and ritual. It was also during this period that Rivera acquired land farther south where he designed and began building a museum for his collection. That building is called Anahuacali, which means house near the waters in the Aztec language, Nahua. There is here, he collaborated with friend and architect Juan O'Gorman to develop an architectural style that was both modern and functional, but also informed by pre-Columbian forms and precedent. In the photograph on the bottom, you see the dining room as it appears today with the yellow floor, the yellow dining room table, and the shelves loaded with folk ceramics. Aspects of this approach also shaped the addition to Kahlo's home that Rivera and Kahlo undertook in the 1940s. We see this here in the photograph on the left. Notice that the volumes are geometric. The windows are factory style. Yet the addition is faced with locally sourced volcanic stone to give it an organically Mexican character. Notice also the variety of native cacti that Kahlo and Rivera cultivated in the garden. In the photograph on the right, you see Frida and Diego standing next to the pyramid, which originally had a traditional thatched roof. My interest in Frida Kahlo's home and garden and the inspiration it provided for her creativity as a painter 
began when I was invited to curate an exhibition of her work at the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx. This was an extraordinary privilege. Working with the team at the NYBG, I learned so much more about Frida Kahlo and the importance of plants and animals as sources of inspiration for her painting. The exhibition premiered in 2015 and traveling components based on the concept were recently exhibited in Richmond, Virginia, Kansas City, and Jackson, Michigan, and they're now in San Antonio and Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Here you see views of the garden that we created in the beautiful glass house at the Botanical Garden in the Bronx, where we collaborated with scenic designer Scott Pask to evoke the pyramid that Diego Rivera built, as well as the iconic blue walls of the Casa Sur. In addition to a Mexican garden inspired by Kahlo's and the set pieces by Scott Pask, the exhibition included 14 original paintings by Frida, two of which are on view now in the exhibition at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. Portrait of Luther Burbank is one of only two paintings that Kahlo completed while she was living in San Francisco with Rivera. He had been commissioned to paint a mural called Allegory of California in the Pacific Stock Exchange. Rivera's painting celebrated the bounty of California's land and its leaders of industry and science. Horticulturist Luther Burbank, widely recognized during his lifetime for his hybridizing work, was among the figures Rivera depicted. Burbank was known for developing hundreds of cultivated varieties of fruits and vegetables and other plants including the disease-resistant Burbank potato. In 1931, five years after his death, Burbank was the subject of articles and remained something of a popular celebrity in the Depression-era United States. While Kahlo typically depicted friends and family in her paintings, Burbank's fame and Kahlo's interest in duality and hybrid identity may have led her to adopt him as the subject for the painting. Kahlo first created a study for the portrait, and this is important because it complicates the popular notion that Kahlo painted directly from life. In fact, she often worked not only from sketches, but from photographs, as she did here. In the sketch and the portrait, Kahlo depicted Burbank straight on. He holds clustered vines with massive, deeply serrated leaves that resemble philodendrons, a large genus of tropical plants many of which are native to the rainforests of Central and South America. The source for the pose seems to be a photograph of Burbank depicting him in a greenhouse holding a clustered philodendron vine extending upward from a pot. While Burbank is not known to have worked with philodendron, the genus was significant in ancient Aztec culture. Basket flower, Huacal Xochitl in Nahuatl, is a member of the philodendron family and it was often depicted in ancient codices and was associated with fertility, a fitting theme for a portrait of such a prolific plantsman. Many species of philodendron are native to Central America, which may also have appealed to Frida Kahlo, and eventually a variety of philodendron were planted in the garden at the Casa Sur. In her sketch, Kahlo has transformed Burbank into a tree, rooted to the soil from which he coaxed so many cultivars during his lifetime. His root system wraps around a vaguely humanoid shape that resembles a shrouded body. On either side of the central figure, food crops, among them carrots and beets, are depicted in various stages of growth, from growing of seeds to flowering to fruiting. Hands extending down toward the earth signify Burbank's work tending and selecting plants. When he died, he was buried under a cedar of Lebanon tree in his garden. Frida and Diego visited his home and garden during their time in San Francisco. In the painted portrait, Burbank's legs are fused together to form a tree trunk that takes root among human remains below the surface of the soil. The skeleton in which Burbank is rooted is rendered with great detail and seems to be nurturing the figure and the surrounding soil. The two citrus trees in the background, one with foliage and small fruit stands in sharp contrast to the almost stubby leafless branches that bear much larger, brightly colored fruit. These allude directly to Burbank's work, which specifically sought to increase the food supply. He briefly experimented with hybridizing citrus to grow in cooler climates. 
One way to think about this painting is as a botanical illustration, showing the roots, stem, and leaves, and clearly labeling the specimen, the man himself. With its theme of man-plant hybrid and the bleak landscape enlivened only by the symbolic trees, it's no surprise that this painting is frequently referred to as Kahlo's first surrealist work. Such hybrids are often found in the work of European surrealists, such as Max Ernst and Salvador Dali. But duality is central to the Aztec worldview and hybridity to Mexico's cultural discourse of mestizaje. So these themes, along with the figure's closeness with nature, are ones that Kahlo would continue to employ in her future work. In Flower of Life, Kahlo imaginatively reconfigured several plants, a poinsettia, a mandrake root, and a red angel's trumpet, or floripondio. Poinsettia, called Noche Buena in Spanish, was considered a medicinal plant in pre-conquest Mexico, useful for stimulating milk production in mothers who could not lactate enough. Kahlo creatively re-envisioned a mandrake root by combining both male and female reproductive organs, suggesting familiarity with the medicinal use and historical myths around this legendary member of the nightshade. Ancient medicinal books described mandrake roots as useful for fertility, a subject that was close to Frida's heart. This belief combined with the pain dulling and hallucinogenic effects of the mandrake plant also lended an, era, an aura of magic dating back to ancient times. Finally, the floripondio or the trumpet flower is also a nightshade. Some varieties are toxic while others are prized as having hallucinogenic properties. In Flower of Life, Kahlo relied on her knowledge of human anatomy as well. This was gained from her study of medical textbooks while in high school to correlate the flower's elements to male and female reproductive anatomy. The lightning bolt seems her way of suggesting the mo moment of conception. Given the different plant properties, here again, Kahlo alludes to the cyclical nature of life and death. This painting was originally titled Flame Flower, and the work was included in an exhibition of flower paintings in Mexico City in 1944. The title of the painting suggests that Kahlo may have been trying to distract from the explicit nature of the work as flame flower is a common name for Mexican poinsettia. According to one source, despite the different title, the work was still considered too explicit for public viewing and was shown in a separate room for the duration of the exhibition. Here, I'm comparing Kahlo's Flower of Life with a Georgia O'Keeffe painting to Calla Lilies in Pink. Kahlo and O'Keeffe met and Kahlo wrote a letter to O'Keeffe, which is in the library of the, which is in the Beinecke Library at Yale. She wrote, I thought of you a lot and never forget your wonderful hands and the color of your eyes. I will see you soon. If you're still in the hospital when I come back, I will bring you flowers. So this was a letter that Kahlo wrote from Detroit to O'Keeffe in 1933. It's suggestive of their close friendship, but I think it's also important for thinking about Kahlo's interest in painting flowers in relation to the fame that O'Keeffe had achieved as a woman artist who painted extraordinary paintings of flowers. So I'd like to conclude my presentation where I began by observing some details about one last work, My Nurse and I, that you'll have an opportunity to see in the exhibition at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. Here, Kahlo has combined a self-portrait with both the Mesoamerican specifically the Olmec culture, and with Euro-Christian traditional, with the Euro-Christian tradition, which is also of course part of Mexican culture. Drawing inspiration from Roman Catholic portraits of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus, Kahlo has with extraordinary bravado creatively depicted herself as the Messiah. This is a truly bold statement. At the same time, however, this is not actually a painting of the Virgin Mary, but a painting of an indigenous wet nurse one whose face Kahlo has hidden behind an Olmec mask. The Olmec civilization is considered one of the oldest settled civilizations of Mesoamerica. By combining these traditions, Kahlo expresses her own dualistic and hybrid sense of identity. However, at the same time, given my discussion at the beginning of my presentation about the ways that elite intellectuals in Mexico laid claim to indigenous culture in order to formulate 
a national mestizo culture in the post-revolutionary decades. I offer that perhaps what we have here is Kahlo's ironic statement about revolutionary indigenism. So I'll conclude there. I hope the information I've presented provides a context for your encounter with the many incredible paintings and drawings on view in the exhibition, Frida Kahlo Timeless at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. Thank you for your interest and attention and enjoy the exhibition. <laughs>